Uh, for those of you online, in case you were not aware, we will be having a special meeting ahead of the normal work session tonight to um, <coughs> elect two of the representatives to the board. So that will be the first meeting. Call that meeting to order. Special meeting of the members of the Columbia Association. Okay, so I will start by calling roll. Ginny? Present. Dick? Here. Lynn? Not yet here. Tina? Here. Jess? I think that's our only She's on the screen. Here. On the screen. Oh. She's on the screen. Jess? Okay, Jess is on the screen. Uh, Lakey is not yet here, and I am here. Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. So first up is the election of the River Hill representative and the Harper's Choice representative to the Columbia Association Board of Directors. So the resolution as read, election to of the director to the board, whereas the following person, effective September 13th, 2021, is the Columbia Council representative appointed by the Board of Directors of the River Hill Village Community Association, Eric <coughs> Greenberg, Village of River Hill, and whereas the following person, effective October 5th, 2021, is the Columbia Council representative appointed by the Board of Directors of the Harbor's Choice Village Community Association, Ashley Vaughn, Village of Harper's Choice. <clears throat> and whereas pursuant to the terms of the Columbia Association Charter and Bylaws, such Columbia Council representatives are members of the corporation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the members hereby elect to the Board of Directors effective October 14th, 2021, Eric Greenberg, the newly appointed Columbia Council representative from River Hill, and Ashley Vaughn, the newly appointed Columbia Council representative from Harper's Choice. Do I have any objections to, well, I'll do a roll call vote, because I'm sorry I did not include Eric and Ashley in the initial roll call. So, Ginny? Yes. Dick? Yes. Lynn? And not. Tina? Yes. Jess? And she got a thumb thumbs up. up. Okay. <laughs> I don't. I can't see you on the screen, Jess. She got so her thumb up. That's. Uh, yeah, I know, but I can't see that because I'm reading a script. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm translating. Well, I, Eric. I'll, I'll keep an eye. Yes. On her. Ashley. <laughs> yes. Uh, Lakey's not here, and me. Yes. And I haven't been mentioned. I'm sorry, Sherry. Where did your <laughs> name go? Oh, because you know what? Thumbs 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 I'm so sorry. <laughs> and Andy too. I. You know what? Because I have a blank column. Very sorry. Okay. <laughs> I added a column, and I have a gap. So Andy? Yes. And Sherry? Yes. Thank you. All right. Approved. Okay, can I have a motion to adjourn the special meeting? So moved. Second. Ginny moves, Tina seconds. Any objection? Okay. Special meeting is adjourned and we will reconvene in um, approximately five minutes for some administrative activity in between meetings.
Good evening, everyone. I'm Janet Evans, Chair of the CA Board of Directors. Please remember that this meeting of the CA Board of Directors is being live streamed. You can find tonight's agenda and background materials on the CA Board's webpage, and links to these documents can also be found in the description section of, your, of the YouTube live stream for those who are watching the meeting there. If you are virtual, please mute your microphones and phones unless you're speaking. And if you're in the room, please ensure that your cell phones are silenced. Uh, raise your hand to speak and I will record the names in the order in which I see them. If you are virtual, um, please use the chat feature and I would appreciate anyone in the room helping me keep track of if Jess is <laughs> indicating in the chat feature because I can't always see it. Um, as we move through the meeting, I will introduce each item on the agenda before a vote is taken. I will restate a motion as well as who motioned and seconded. And if at any point you have trouble hearing me or any other board member, please say so. And I will now call the roll. Andy. Here. Sherry. Here. Ginny. Here. Dick. Here. Lynn. Here. Tina. Yep. Jess. Here. Eric. Here. Ashley. Here. Uh, Lakey's not here yet, and me, Janet. Okay. <clears throat> All right, our timekeeper for tonight is Dick Bolton. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Jenny approved, and Tina seconded. Any objections? Okay. Agenda is approved unanimously. We will move on to resident speak out. Resident speak out is available to anyone who submitted ahead of time. Please keep in mind that you have three minutes to speak and um, Dick will let us know when. Russ, are you having trouble hearing us? You have your hand raised, okay. Uh, Dick will let us know when your time is up. So first up we have Russ Swatek. Hello, I'm Russ Swatek from the village of Longreach. I was on the CA board for four years and during that time, some folks came to me thinking, wanting my help to quiet Merriweather Post Pavilion. I went to a couple of their houses. They were both over a mile away, straight line distance from Merriweather. And I felt Merriweather's vibrations, not just heard the noise, even inside the basement of one of their closed houses. The then county exec, Ken Ullman, rather than protecting the right of his constituents, to enjoy their own property in peace, tucks the Howard County State delegation into sponsoring a bill raising the noise, the noise limits for just Merriweather. The new Merriweather noise limits were far higher than what every other Maryland entity is required to follow and extended the noise cutoff time from 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. Merriweather in 67 originally only had five loudspeakers, all contained within a much smaller pavilion. Speaker technology has come a long way in the last 54 years since Merriweather founded. Merriweather was never intended to be a loud, booming rock venue serenading the whole countryside. Maria Alvarez lives 1.57 miles straight line distance from Merriweather and can understand the Merriweather singer's words. Dick Bolton lives 2.81 miles straight line distance from Merriweather and has stated he needs to close his windows to sleep due to Merriweather. The Boyders, who have lived where they are now since before Merriweather was built, live 4.18 miles straight line distance from Merriweather and hear the booming beat from Merriweather. A loud outdoor rock venue has no place in the middle of a developing city. Merriweather has a history of not being a good neighbor even telling folks who complained of the noise to move. And some of them have moved because of Merriweather. We are looking for CA support to convince the Howard County State Delegation to remove the higher limits for Merriweather and make them live by the rules that apply to everybody else. We are going to prepare a letter addressed to all the Howard County State Delegation and County Council members explaining the situation and ask them to remove the higher and longer noise limits enacted for just Merriweather. We ask that you sign this letter. The packet of info for the CA board session states that currently there is no pre-filed state legislation and that the deadline is in November. This would be a good time for CA to provide input to the Howard County State Delegation 
to persuade them to file corrective legislation so that Howard County residents do not have to suffer through the 2022 Merriweather season. That's all. Thank you, Russ. Do I have any questions for Russ? Jess does. Jess has a question. Oh, Jess. Yeah, my question is just, you said that we were doing this and we were, you know, wanting CA's help. Who is we? We right now is Alex Akimian and Maria Alvarez. Uh, Alex was the founder of Calm Citizens Against Loud Music from Merriweather years ago, and were successful back then when Merriweather wanted to enact increased noise limits. Uh, Unfortunately, that was not effective this time. Uh, <clears throat> we, the three of us, have been meeting periodically with the Howard County uh, Health Department, who has the responsibility for monitoring noise and getting them to be more vigilant about what they monitor. I mean, unfortunately, this last season, they only monitored seven out of 17 concerts. And we just found out yesterday that, oh, to write a citation against a commercial entity, the Howard County Health Department has to do it. Now, while they are not in the field, yeah, the people call the police complaining about noise. The police will come out. They have noise monitors. And if they detect a violation from Merriweather, they can't write it up. They can't issue a citation. They can only issue a citation just against a residential address. So, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Okay, next up, uh, and I will apologize in advance for how I pronounce your last name, but Michael Galibersuk. Galibersuk, still Galibersuk. Galibersuk, thank you. All right, so uh, first of all, I'm, I'm representing Owen Brown, and, and I believe folks representing groups get five minutes, so please don't cut me out of at three. Um, I noticed that you're reviewing village finances this evening. So I'm taking the opportunity to testify about the inequitable way CA invests in various village associations. On a per capita basis, village budgets are wildly unequal. They range from about $20 per resident in one village to about $90 per resident in another. The discrepancy I think is driven by four compounding factors. First, historical disparities in the size and number of facilities beaten, built in each village. Facility space per capita ranges from around a third of a foot per resident in some villages to around two and a half feet per resident in others. Second, continued decisions not to address the historic imbalance in facility construction while continuing to invest capital budgets to maintain existing village facilities. Although not addressed in this evening's slide presentation, CA's approved capital budget per village for the last decade ranged around $49 per resident to $341 per resident in other villages. Third, the assessment share formula gives villages a substantial amount of money based on the facilities they've already been gifted by CA. More subsidized facilities from CA equals more operational funding from CA. It's a rich get richer formula. And fourth, villages use the facilities provided by CA to generate wildly different amounts of rental <coughs> revenue. To be clear, it's not that some villagers are more effective at managing their rentals. There's a direct correlation between the amount of facility space villages have been provided and their ability to generate rental revenue. The end result is, is, is a meaningful amount of money. If Owen Brown had the same per capita budget as Town Center, our budget would be over $484,000 larger, closer to tripling our operational budget. This means residents in some villages are subsidizing village benefits in others that their village doesn't receive in return. So I've got four requests from CA. First, make it standard practice to include per capita statistics when reviewing village, village finances like you are tonight. Second, put the issue of disparity in village investment on your list of topics to address. Third, develop a long-term plan to deliver parity in village facilities. Options could include closing facilities that aren't used much, building new ones, <clears throat> excuse me, credits to facilities, to, to low facility villages to make up for their lack of facilities, requiring rental sh revenue sharing amongst the villages and remove, uh, 
removing the facility credit from the formula and reinvesting that money across villages on a per capita basis. Hmm. In the short term, starting next year, starting next year, hopefully, provide a monetary subsidy to low village facilities and bring them into parity with other villages until the formula can be altered. These issues concern more than just Owen Brown. I've discussed this topic with, Hick with the Hickory Ridge Board, uh, who receives the least amount of money per capita, and they agree that this should be a topic that CA addresses. The five minutes I'm allotted isn't enough time to discuss all the details and nuances of this issue. I know I haven't hit all the different points of view, nor all the history, so please don't hold that against me. Uh, I hope we all agree that while villages should have their unique aspects, one of the unique aspects shouldn't be that some villages are getting four and a half times as much money from CA as the other villages. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Janet, quick question. Uh, yeah, Jenny has a question. Yeah. Michael, uh, could you yes. please send us your testimony? Yeah, sure thing. Thank you very much. <clears throat> very helpful. Are there any other questions? <clears throat> okay, thank you, Michael. Okay, next up we have Maria Alvarez. Uh, good evening, thank you. Um, I'm sure if you're um, members of HCCA, you've seen a lot of my emails in the last seven years regarding Meriwether. Uh, we had a meeting again yesterday with the health department, which we've been meeting with for the last three years, and nothing happens. They just monitor, they do things, they show us what they did, plane, train, whatever, and nothing gets done. Yesterday, uh, there was a meeting uh, to which I attached the noise complaints from tw 2015, noise complaints with the police department. From 2015 to 2021, I had a letter from Becky Dickerson, who's a Beaver Brook resident and longtime Columbia resident who's a neighbor. I had an um, information from Carol Galbraith and Jane Weiner, who are 27 years residents of Wild Lake that are up until 2014 never had a problem with Wild Lake. Same as my neighbor, Becky Dickerson, uh, who's lived here for for decades in Beaver Brook, no problem until 2014. I also had an um, email from uh, Ross Owens, who's a Beaver Brook resident, that he thought a helicopter was hovering over his house in 2019. Uh, Ross is an engineer, and uh, he had sent an email that embraces how Meriwether can, if they choose, become good neighbors with uh, noise uh, mitigation things. He's an engineer, so he knows what he's talking about. There was also a financial analysis of MPP's contribution to the county that was sent out by Chris Oliva of uh, HCCA a few years ago. And just, it's, Meriwether brings less than a million dollars a year. Um, we have to pay the taxpayers, we pay for the police department. They don't pay for the police department. And my neighborhood of Beaverbrook has about 270 homes. We pay $1,755 in taxes. I, I was doing a mid-figure of $6,500 per home. So you can imagine what all the other neighborhoods around are paying. So really, when everybody tells you that Meriwether brings a lot except noise and people can't sleep, you can't sit outside in your house, that, that, that is nothing compared to what the residents are having to put up with because the legislation needs to change it back to where it was again and it needs to stay. Meriwether was already breaking the law, Guzzoni and Ullman did it, and um, Lamb, Aaron's Lamb was supposed to be, very, you know, he, he was gonna be involved, but for some reason now, there's no appetite for the legislation. There is, there should be not just appetite, because what I have right now, it's a stomach ache, because he thinks that there's no appetite for it. Something needs to be done. You cannot have Meriwether continue to bother thousands. I also have a map of the area that uh, Maria, shows- you're at three minutes, so if you could wrap up, please. Okay, Don Login, down to King's Contrivance, Don Lee. This isn't just Wild Lake Center or Town Center. This is all over, not just Columbia, but it's Ellicott City and Howard County. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have questions for Maria? OK, 
Okay, thank you, Maria. Next up, we have Alex Hakanian. Alex, you're on. Okay, we'll come back to Alex if he comes on. Uh, next up, we have John Rin. Hi. Hello. Uh, John Rin, my wife Joanne uh, <clears throat> has been director and owner with me of the Lornwood Daycare Center, also known as the Wild Lake Child Development Center in the Bright Woods neighborhood for the past 40 years. We are asking for your support to grant an easement so that our employees, our clients, and vendors can have access to the adjacent parking lot, the sidewalks, the utility connections, and the refuse area. We have been good neighbors and believe that we provide a valuable service to the community since we purchased the property from CA in 1980. Please let me know if you have any questions about our request. Thank you, John. Are there any questions for John? Okay, we appreciate you coming out tonight. Thank you. Next up, we have Tom Meacham. Good evening, Tom Meacham. I'm an attorney in Columbia. I've been helping John and Joanne Wren uh, with their property, various aspects of it. Uh, tonight before you on your agenda is a discussion of the deed of easement that John referenced. The reason that this is necessary is that when they bought the property from CA back in the early 80s, they didn't realize that a lot of the property that uh, supports the daycare center is not owned by the property that they purchased. It's owned by CA. So this last year when they were looking at their property, um, considering the use, considering a possible sale or lease of the property, it turned out that they found out their parking lot and a lot of other of the uh, supporting land around them is actually owned by CA. This subject didn't happen to come up in the early 80s. So to um, CA's credit, when it was brought to their attention, uh, they've been working on an easement for these various uses that you'll hear in the discussion of the agenda item. And it's absolutely necessary for the use of the daycare center that the easements be approved. Um, I want to say, and I can speak for John on this also, that Brady Greer has been really helpful in terms of putting the paperwork together for this, responding to our questions and concerns. And so I want to compliment her to the board for all of her work. Um, so that we ask that you approve the easement. Certainly happy to answer any questions about the need for it or the details of it. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Do we have any questions? Uh, Jenny? Yeah. Hi, Tom. Hi, Jenny. Uh, just a quick question. Um, you're selling it, they're selling it as another daycare center, correct? Correct. Yeah, um, and it's been a very successful one uh, that they've had there for a long time and it's done a lot of good. What, what I'm trying to figure <laughs> out is um, if the new people don't make it and decide to sell it as something, I know that maybe the county would have to approve that use or uh, unless it's a matter of right on that property, that's what I'm not sure of. But would this easement allow some other use there if uh, if it was sold by the next owner to somebody, uh, allow them to have the parking and everything else when we don't want that other use there at all? It would not be compatible with the neighborhood. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to get around that, you know, how. You can compliment your staff, Brady Greer, for looking out for that. In the deed of easement, it indicates that if it's going to be a use other than a daycare, then CA has the right to withdraw the grant of the easements, and so that wouldn't be possible. Uh, there'd be no parking, no access to private utilities for the property, okay. uh, no pedestrian access, and it gives CA the right to terminate the easements if a use other than a daycare use is being proposed for the property. You're also right, the county would have to approve it through a new FDP that would allow the use. So. Um, but based on the deed of easement, that's just not something that is possible. 
Okay, so you, f you feel the residents are protected then. Okay, thank you. And I was gonna ask Dennis the same question later, but thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Tom. Any other questions? Okay, uh, next up we have Richard McCready. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Good evening. My name is Richard McCready, and I live in the village of Oakland Mills. I'm here to talk to you tonight about the Inner Arbor Trust and Meriwether Park at Symphony Woods. As a music teacher in the Howard County Schools, I see so much value in the many ways the Inner Arbor Trust is reaching out to young people in our community. They're providing opportunities to experience high quality live music through free and low cost performances that range from musical theater and opera to hands-on musical experiences all the way to the world-class excellence of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. Both the Chrysalis Kids series and many other Chrysalis events are a beautiful in investment in today's students whose lives will forever be enriched by them. As a parent, I've been grateful for the Trust's commitment to offering an entire season of outdoor events at a time when COVID makes group gatherings so risky. Their guidelines for masking and distancing, as well as making sure they could perform contact tracing if necessary, opened a door for many area families to enjoy live performances safely this summer. As a resident of Columbia, I'm thrilled by how the Trust consistently works to program music representing a variety of cultures. The Cultura Planera concert, the celebration of Puerto Rican music, dance, and culture was truly a high point for me this summer. Since its opening, the Chrysalis has welcomed a diverse array of performers and musical styles. <clears throat> Combined with their commitment to free and low cost concerts, the trust is the essence of what Columbia strives to be, welcoming all, celebrating all. As a Howard County resident, I'm excited by the trust's continued focus on good stewardship of the land in the park. New pervious pathways make events more accessible to residents and prevent toxic runoff. The collaboration with Howard EcoWorks this summer to continue environmentally focused projects is in alignment with Howard County's own environmental goals. As the faculty advisor for my school's Gender Sexuality Alliance, I was impressed by the Trust's partnership with Howard County Pride and many other Columbia and Howard County organizations to present HOCO Pride last weekend. This event provided a safe and celebratory environment for all of our LGBTQ plus community members, including our young people, that showed acceptance and a commitment to their well-being. It takes vision, dedication, and hard work to make the connections, nurture the relationships, and forge the partnerships that have made all of this happen. Even looking at the past season alone, it is clear that the Inner Arbor Trust led by President Nina Basu is exceeding expectations as they work to create, operate, and care for Meriwether Park at Symphony Woods. I thank you for your continued support of the Trust as they bring unique, welcoming, and inclusive experiences to our community. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Richard. Do we have any questions for Richard? Okay, thank you very much. All right, has Alex joined? Uh, can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can. Alex, okay, you're good. Uh, uh, before I start, I, I just got to tell you, um, I don't have this problem with any other virtual uh, video conference, but with Google Meet, uh, I keep getting disconnected for whatever reason, and I haven't been able to fix it. Don't know, understand why, but um, that's why I'm coming uh, via phone rather than through a video just to let you know. Thank you. Um, you've been hearing tonight uh, about the operators of the Meriwether Post Pavilion and how disrespectful they've been toward not only the residents of Columbia, but also to CA. Uh, they've apparently violated easement agreements between Meriwether and CA. They've caused Symphony Woods to be damaged due to their events. And most recently, they've allowed performances at the Chrysalis to be disrupted by Meriwether's loud sound checks. That kind of disrespect should not be tolerated, let alone rewarded. And I empathize with CA on this issue and support your efforts to prevail in protecting Symphony Woods and regaining control over CA's property. So as far
far as the, the noise blasting away from uh, Merriweather, uh, before 2013, the noise from Merriweather didn't cause a lot of complaints. But in 2013, they persuaded the, the operators persuaded the delegation to weaken the state noise laws in order to allow greater noise volumes over a longer period of time. And they claimed that the noise from their events would be no worse than it was before. Well, we were misled. Uh, the noise did get louder, and many more people started calling the health department and the police to complain about the noise. And to make matters worse, the health department records show that in the years since 2013, Meriwether has actually violated even the weaker laws. Now, Meriwether can continue to operate, but they can at least turn down the volume, still satisfy their audiences, as well as Columbia's residents. But instead, they choose to blast away and ignore their impacts. And I hope that you agree that this abuse can no longer be tolerated, because they have broken faith with not only the delegation, the county council, and CA, uh, and the many residents of Columbia. So uh, Russ was suggesting uh, a letter that um, I'm hoping that the CA board will support and sign uh, to the state delegation uh, seeking to restore the noise standards to the pre-2013 levels. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Do we have any questions for Alex? Dick? Uh, yes, Alex, um, you say something about a letter. Are you preparing a letter for us to look at or are you asking us to write a letter? Um, it could be a joint. It, it, it probably would be a joint letter um uh, i would i would defer to russ since he was the one that uh recommended it initially mm. but yeah uh, i see it as uh, as a cooperative kind of uh, endeavor well i would suggest probably the fastest way to get this done is if you prepared something that we can take a look at and uh, decide whether it's something we wanted to send or not sure sure that that sounds great any other questions? Mm -mm. Okay, thank you, Alex. Okay, thank you. Uh, that wraps up resident speak out for this evening. So we'll move on to our work session topics. First up is an update on the Columbia conversation. Let's talk. Good evening, everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and present my screen. This is Danica here. And I no longer can see you all, so hopefully you can see this okay. Um, uh, Danica, all, it's not, those it's those not up I, yet. I uh, haven't met or met uh, very informally. I'm Danica Rines, the uh, Manager of Communications and Media Relations here for Columbia Association. And I'm here to talk tonight uh, very briefly, albeit, about the Columbia Conversation, which has been a big focus of ours um, right now i'm so sorry can everybody see my screen we cannot no? see your screen yet no, no. okay that no. is helpful <laughs> Shoot. Not really. no. let's try this again you know what i did the whole there we go let's so. try this again i did the whole um present but not yeah. share uh, you gotcha. think yep, you know now we can see long, it, we have it down, <laughs> but we don't um <laughs> let's try that again I appreciate your patience. Um, I appreciate your time here tonight. And um, like I said, I'm gonna give you an update on the Columbia conversation. For those of you who um, may you know, be unfamiliar with the conversation, this is a project we started back in the summer and it's when it launched, it kind of got revamped probably a couple months ago now. And we felt like this was a great time to give you a little bit of an update on where we are and where we're heading. So I'm gonna walk through some of the main purposes of the project, the uh, main channels of input that we have from, for the community and what we've seen so far with those. And there hopefully, if I do this right, will be a little bit of time for questions and comments at the end. So I'm happy to field those as well. Now, I've had to remind myself about this. I want you to keep in mind that this is indeed a grassroots project. It is unlike anything at least I have ever been a part of on, with this organization in my short time here. And from what I hear from my coworkers who have been here um, much longer than I have, it is unlike a lot of things we have ever done before. So with those sorts of 
uh, projects and that sort of work. It is truly a work in progress and a lot of room for growth here. And we look forward to seeing where, what direction the community takes us in with this. So um, starting with just the intention here, you know, the conversation was really created to energize the community, provide this universal and open platform where people can come and talk about all things Columbia and really create a space where CA is accessible. I've been describing it um, in layman's terms as kicking the door wide, wide open. If there was just a little crack in the door where people could come in before, hopefully this is helping to get that door a lot more um, wide open and accessible for folks. It was created to engage, really showing and recognizing that CA is interested in real listening and two-way conversations here, reporting back and you know, encouraging deeper conversations as well. And lastly, we're here to empower. Um, this, this project is really uh, meaning to identify areas where CA and our partners can better serve the needs and desires of our community by listening and really actively listening. I found this quote I wanted to share from Margaret J. Margaret J. Wheatley that says, there is no power for change greater than a community discovering what it cares about. And I think that is so great and such a great representation of what we are trying to do here, which is really following along with a community, maybe discovering or rediscovering what it cares about, redefining it, putting some words to it. So the main channels for interaction, the main areas where we're going out and engaging are these three. The Columbia Conversation website, columbiaconversation.org. I hope you all have gotten a chance to take a look at that. The Columbia Conversation Facebook group, and of course, in-person engagement as well, which we are so blessed to be able to be back out and doing. So quickly, I'll go over these three and then we'll dive into them a little more um, intensely. ColumbiaConversation.org, the site's averaging about 15 visits a day with a one-day peak of uh, 45 visits. Most of the people are new visitors to the site, so not a lot of repeat customers. We continue, though, really to get new interest through our public events and our Facebook group as well. This is a lot about kind of cross-promoting here. And you may have also seen the banner across CA's website, if you've been there recently, that actually pushes people to ColumbiaConversation.org. And more than 100 people, I'm happy to say, have found the conversation through that option as well. So the Facebook group, we continue to grow our engagement there and now have a very deliberate content schedule moving forward here. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And then, of course, the in-person engagement. We really have made this effort to simply get out there more with engagement tools and conversation materials. I'm sure a lot of you have seen. And just encouraging people to check things out. That's really what it's all about right now. Um, just making sure that they know that this portal is available to them. And these are all really targeting different audience, audiences in different ways with different kinds of conversation. And I think you'll, if you haven't seen that already, you'll hopefully see that here in a moment. So we will um, hit a few key areas of the website here really quickly. Again, I'm trying to be brief. Um, First being the exercises we're inviting people to participate in. So I'm happy to say we've had about 174, 75 submissions through these exercises. That does not include a handful of blog posts we've actually gotten as well. What you're looking at right now is a scale of one to 10, as I call it. This has had the most people complete it with 74, followed by a priority checklist activity that we set up that's what you're seeing right here. That had 51 people just check what, you know, makes a great community and what is most important, and then ranking their top priorities. 24 people have answered the question of the week. 10 people have left reviews of our community, and 15 have dropped something in the virtual suggestion box. So that's kind of a more open forum where people can visit and just uh, make a suggestion. Sometimes. People come to this site knowing what they want to talk about. Some people just come to be inspired and, and maybe, um, you know, seek something out to uh, spark something in them. So we have seen everything covered from transportation to schools to paths to sustainability to safety. Um, it really has already been coming up on the website. Awesome. I want to touch briefly, too, on the findings section, which we're just starting to populate right now. 
I want to stress um, that this is, uh, you know, anything that we put up here is not just statistically significant. I think that's important here. Again, the point of all of this is really, again, to just make sure people know that we're here and actively listening. So we, again, started to report some of this back. Some of these are in quotes, as you can imagine, we've gotten some written responses. These are just a couple of few examples of those. And I encourage you to look at the findings uh, page on the site for, for more of these. I won't go through every one of these. Some we're doing in image form. So these are graphical representations of the averages that we're seeing on our uh, reviews of Columbia, as well as that one to 10 ranking I showed you. So for instance, 8.2 was about the average for how schools ranked on a scale of one to 10 schools in education. So uh, out of 10, of course, and then 6.8 for arts and education. And you can see the, the stars there as well. And the last way we're representing this is with graphs and charts. So this right here is representing our priority checklist. So that was the one where you could actually go through and check anything that you thought was important. And then rank second and third priority based on those lists. And there was also an opportunity to write in some things as well. So um, on your left, you just see anything that was checked on your uh, right there, the right side of the screen is first, second, and third priority. So again, if, I know these might be hard to see um, from your angle there. So I would highly encourage you, these are all up right now on the conversations finding page. And again, um, you know, smaller, not hugely representative audiences here quite yet. We're getting there, but these are some indications that we, again, are listening and reporting back to the people in, in participating in this. So moving to the Facebook group, uh, there are currently about 190, just shy of 190 members. But popular posts are getting well over 300 views. So that's encouraging as well. Facebook's also driving quite a bit of traffic to the site itself which is interesting. Um, we'll be posting a lot of times, we'll post um, you know, something for feedback and then as well say, you know, this is also featured on ColumbiaConversation.org. And to understand the breadth of topics and subjects uh, we're including on this platform, I did wanna show you just a couple posts. The first one uh, was probably our most popular post and this asked where people were originally from, how long they've been in Columbia, had they ever thought about leaving? We got about 18 comments from folks, and I am not going to read through all of them. Again, this is all accessible um, online, but you know, everywhere from people talking about coming from another county, from another state, to um, you know, Barbara Kellner, of course, chiming in, uh, saying she was raised in Queens and kind of telling her story, and it was just a really great. Um, interaction piece we you know we sometimes post these things not really knowing or um, having expectations of how people will engage and it was just really beautiful to see some people even play off each other and say oh i'm from Mount, uh, montgomery county as well and i moved here for the same reasons how great um you know this actually all allowed us as well to turn around and report back again not statistically significant but it's been a really great exercise to be able to turn around and say, hey, based on the comments that we got, 72% of you are actually who, who commented were from other states. 70% of you have no plans to leave. Um, you know, grandkids often contribute to things happening one way or the other. Um, it's just another way to show that we are truly listening to what's going on out there. I do want to share um, one more post just because it looks a little different and I think that's important. We are putting these polls out there as well. And this one in particular asked where people stood on uh, volunteering and asked them to tag a nonprofit as well that they think was doing a particularly great job serving this community. So as you can see, most people either said it's a must or I want to do more. We had 10 different comments ranging uh, all different kinds of organizations posted. And um, Hannah Chenoweth is on my team. She is the one really behind the Facebook group right now. She's just doing a spectacular job. And one of, I asked her for any feedback she would like to share with you all through me. And, and one really insightful thing she shared is that people are really willing and ready to dig a little deeper. She's been asking and throwing out their personal questions and topics like mental health and crime, some things that you think may not be as engaging, but people are respectful and engaging on those topics, even more than say the entertainment and kind of more lighthearted hobby flavor topics, if you will. So 
um, just an interesting kind of point. People are hungry for this kind of platform. And last but not least, I do want to uh, touch on some of the in-person things that we're doing because, you know, we really are being intentional about bringing things to the table that aren't just pushing people to the website, but engaging them in person. So this is not always done, I should say, under the banner of the conversation, but it is in that same spirit of looking to connect. So we've done things like you know, put a pin in your favorite spot on the pathways that was done during bike around. During the fourth, we have people put ping, uh, ping pong balls into different buckets for favorite things to do over the summer. This was one of my favorites. If Columbia had a playlist, we did this during Hops and Harvest and got some really, oh, I'm sorry about that, some really interesting uh, responses there. Just trying to get people to think in a little bit of a different way. So snail mail, we are family, you rock my world, higher love, some good answers there, some creative people. And finally, I know a lot of you were out at HOCO Pride this weekend in uh, Symphony Woods, and our design team helped us put together this incredible board asking people what pride meant to them. And it was um, really great to see all of the different responses. We did save these, by the way, and trying to come up with a creative way to really um, have these available in the future as well. But it really goes to show that I think just being out there matters to this community. And it's a perfect example too of, you know, maybe these comments won't yield anything for CA as an organization to change things, maybe they will, maybe they will. But it just is a low friction engagement opportunity with our community that is so important. So as far as where we're going, we are continuing to grow that blog section. Of course, we're going to find ways to continually and steadily grow our audience and engagement. And we have some plans to push some refresh materials as well, especially on display at CA. Um, but as, you know, Miss. Wheatley put it so well, we can, will continue to discover what this community cares about. And that's really what it's all about. I know I'm like two minutes left. Dick, I know you're probably had the time. <laughs> you got 45 <laughs> seconds, Danica. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say two minutes. Okay. Dick, Dick's easy. <laughs> so, do we, uh, Ginny, do a quick question. Danica, great job. Um, it sounded like there were some events where you actually went to specific uh, uh, areas of Columbia or individuals or groups, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Could you uh, elaborate on that, please? Sure. So where we had those engagement opportunities that I just put up? Is that what you're asking? Well, like, I guess pride was one of them, but uh, it sounded like you had more. I'm not sure. Oh, if sure. That's the third. So, um, I, I, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure I had the question right. So um, we actually, we went out to Hops and Harvest. That's where we had the playlist fun question. Um, and handed out conversation cards there. We uh, were out clearly at the 4th of July, um, bike around. We've been at the Howard County Fair, handing out conversation cards. And what am I missing? Oh, the mall, the mall 50th. Those have been the okay. big ones. Um, and I know there have been others. Um, Jenny, the, the calendar is like one big blob right now for me as I move through the fall busy season, but those were the big ones. And I will attest that Danica is everywhere. I, I have not been to an event yet, so. Uh, are they listed on uh, the website so we'd be able to see them as part of this overview? The, um, as far as- Where like, you've been? On the Columbia Conversation website? Yeah. They, they are not right now. Um, I could look into that possibility, you know, um, right now, I, I, that's an interesting idea. I'll definitely look into it. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like you're going to big events. Okay, Jenny, can uh, I'm we wondering wrap it up if you're going to uh, any small events, like just a neighborhood section or a particular housing project or something like that. We are certainly working through the strategy to, um, you okay. know, where to go next. So I think we had to try some things out and see how it went, and we'll move forward from there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Tina? Sure. I wanted to um, note that um, there is a generational split and perhaps Facebook is for those of us who are um, not millennials and um, Instagram, is that on your target list as well? That's a really great question, Tina. Um, so the reason, and I will try to make this brief, uh, the reason we chose Facebook was a lot of it had to do with the, and this is gonna sound counterintuitive, but the monitoring capabilities on Facebook and mm -hmm. the ability as a group to be able to 
um, approve comments if it got to that point where if, if something kind of went haywire and the spirit of the mm -hmm. conversation was absolutely going nowhere, um, then we wanted to be able to wrangle that in. And so we have we have not explored that capability on Instagram yet, but it's a, it's a great point. The other question I wanted to ask is in the graph that's in our packet on page two, um, there's a, a very high peak in the number of engagements. And I wanna know if that highest peak is September 29th. Ooh. If you can, if it's and zoomable. Of course I pulled the wrong, I pulled some more in depth stuff for tonight and forgot to print out that that graph. Are you, can you tell me, are you referring to the um, Facebook posted? or the? Mm -hmm. Comments posted in the Facebook group? Comments posted in the Facebook group. So I can tell you. There's a, a you know what, I'll just, Tina, can I get back yep, to you on that? Absolutely. I'm so sorry. I'm thank having you. a hard no time worries. like finding the exact one. <laughs> no worries. Great, thank you. I'll make a note. Um, Ashley and then Eric. Great. Hi, Danica, it's Ashley. Um, so I'm thrilled that we have something for community members to be able to chat with. I actually didn't realize that there was a website also. So to piggyback on what Tina said, being able to have it on Instagram and directing them even to the website. Like I realize not everybody on Instagram is also going to be on Facebook, but to get that engagement with the younger demographic, right? Since I'm technically an elder millennial, right? I know that the younger demographic for us um, in looking at Gen Z will still be drawn to a website by pushing them through Instagram. Um, but did you have a target demographic in mind when this was created that you were trying to reach or is it just Columbia residents? So I think the, um, the, the easy answer is no. And the reason behind that is just looking at the landscape of was there even anything for anyone to really just talk about anything Columbia or all things Columbia. And we felt like the answer was no when it came to our community in particular. So I think that first foundational block was really about building something for anyone um, and then kind of taking a step back from there, seeing where the conversation went, um, which we are still kind of doing right now and seeing if it was appropriate to maybe reach out more intently to a certain demographic. Okay, and then have you considered um, incentives like Columbia Association giveaways or anything to encourage participation um, in the surveys or at events to get them to sign up right then? Like, oh, if you join our Facebook group right now, you get a free CA branded item or something to that extent. I think um, at the easy, uh, well, no. <laughs> I, think, I think all things are on the table, um, but we, again, are, um, we were really focused on building the system itself for a while there, and that took up a, a good amount of time. So I think now is the perfect time to bring up that suggestion. So thank you. Awesome. Great, thanks. thanks. Uh, Eric? Yeah, so my, my question is, there, there already are existing uh, groups on Facebook dedicated to Columbia, such as Columbia Live uh, Facebook page that has a, a, a fair following. Have you considered working with some of those groups to try to drive uh, traffic to Columbia Conversations? We absolutely have. Um, great question. Um, and hello, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, we absolutely have. We have been um, struggling a little bit to find the right balance of approaching those groups and not um, making sure they don't feel as though we are trying to draw their membership and their conversations onto our page. So it is definitely an ongoing conversation. Um, and I will tell you that one thing that's um, important to me right now is making sure that our team members are equipped to talk about this before we take it a step further. But that's definitely something on the horizon that we've been looking at, Eric. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dick? Uh, yes, Dick. I'm amazed at the stuff you and Tim come up with. This is very impressive. I got a, a number of questions. I guess the first one is just how you staff this? Is this something that you have one person on or is it a group thing or how, how do you do that? Um, you, you're looking at it, Dick. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Next no, question. Uh, yeah. Tim, of course, is, is a huge part of this effort as well um, and was a massive part of the, the initial launch, which was a huge lift. Um, so the, Tim is a huge part of this. And I mentioned Hannah Chenoweth as well, but she has really been instrumental in making sure that that Facebook group 
um, is maintaining, um, is being monitored in some capacity and has the content that it needs. Well, that was another concern of mine is how this is being monitored. Uh, there's a lot of nastiness that goes on on the web. Do we have a way of uh, um, editing that? So we want to be careful about that because the whole point of the conversation is open conversation and to muzzle that would be, um, you know, not what we want to do. However, I completely understand your concern and it's been one of ours as well. Luckily, we haven't run into that yet, but certainly, again, um, part of our um, initial pursuit of doing the Facebook group rather than some other channels was that ability to monitor the group in that way. So we'll keep, we, we will of course continue and of course prepare for the worst, but so far people have been um, extremely respectful of one another <laughs> and uh, wonderful participants in this. Well, that's good. And I, I certainly wouldn't want you to muzzle. Uh, we, we always appreciate constructive criticism. Dick, we're over time. Can we keep it yeah, succinct? I'm, I have a couple of questions here. Uh, and so I appreciate that. Uh, I was just concerned about that. Um, the other thing is, it, it, this is terrific information we're getting. Uh, how do you share it with us or do we have, I mean, this is something the board could use. Is, is there any way you could summarize, say on a weekly basis, what you're hearing? So I don't know if we're, I'm gonna be honest with you, I, I, I don't know if we're at the point where it would be particularly useful to do on a weekly basis. Um, I can certainly do, um, you know, improve the efforts to get you guys. I mean, this was the first real compilation of information that we have done so far. And I think it's just enough to have, you know, again, none of this, I gotta stress, none of this is statistically significant, um, but it, it's, you know, weekly might be a little too often to have any real good information, um, but certainly I can, I can look into ways to keep you guys uh, all informed. That's good. I have other questions. I'll take them offline and catch you, catch you later. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Thank you so much, Danica. That was great information sure. as always. Apologies for going over. Oh, no worries. All right. Next up, we have the easement request for the Lornwood Day Care Parking and Access. Okay, this seems pretty straightforward. And I had my helmet behind me in case I missed that uh, computer photo. Mm -hmm. But um, so quickly going through it. I had some help. There we go. So zooming out, um, if you're familiar with Wild Lake, this is in Wild Lake, um, Green Mountain Circle. Um, it's uh, adjacent to the Bryant Woods Pool. They've coexisted for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure why the property was sold without um, pro uh, parking rights or without utility access, but it was. And this would correct that condition. Um, you know, we recommend approval. The one interesting thing you might ask is why we would sell a neighborhood center. And I was around. <laughs> I wasn't in this chair. Um, and I was lifeguard way back when. but. The uh, existing neighborhood center that we own now is sitting on the site of a former 7-Eleven. That 7-Eleven suffered severe fire damage, basically burned down. And then um, I suspect that uh, Howard Hughes gave us that property and we moved our neighborhood center to the other location and built a nicer, certainly nicer, not that the other one's not nice, but... Um, <laughs> So we moved to another location, but that's why we sold. It didn't make sense to have two. So um, it's pretty straightforward. I can take questions or... Um... Okay, Dick. Uh, yeah, this does look pretty straightforward. Do we use that parking lot at all? Yes, we do. We do, and there's no real serious overlap, I understand. So we spoke with Kristen Shoulder at the Village Association as well as Marty with the pools, and there is certainly some overlap there, but there's never been an issue with parking. Even in the summer when the pools are Even in the summer, and the easement request, as noted, would not allow for another use. It would only apply if there was a daycare in that building. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions on this easement? Mm -mm. Okay, keep in mind, we'll be voting on this easement at the next meeting. Yeah, Andy. Um, 
Yeah, if the board doesn't object, could we possibly put it under consent? Yeah, we most agenda? certainly can. I mean, in, Does yeah. anyone object to putting that on the consent? No. Nope. So Ashley and Eric, for your information, uh, if we add something to the consent consent agenda, we do not vote on it. We just call it out and it's passed automatically. Got so it. if you ever see anything that's listed under the consent agenda that you feel requires discussion, then you should raise that question to the board ahead of the meeting so that we can take it back off of there and make sure that it's up for discussion. Great, thanks. All right, any objection to having that on the consent agenda? No. Nope. Okay, we'll add that for the next meeting. Thank you, Andy. Okay, next up we have the overview of villages, including the fiscal year 2021 financial results. And I'm back up again along with Jackie. So I've got the um, kind of the operational side of this. <clears throat> Thank you, Drew. So as you know, CA invests significant um, annual charge dollars in the village association budgets, as well as um, providing operational support. And um, I've made it a point, um, I've, you know, we interact with the villages on a daily basis. I've been going around and doing um, pathway tours in the golf cart people mover, which has actually been a lot of fun. And I've seen parts of the pathway system that I haven't seen before, and it's a great way to interact with the village associations. I, I sit in on the monthly meetings. Then are you selling tours? <laughs> All right, moving. I, I, Same. So, um, you know, once a year we do this annual presentation, which is a good way for you to get updated on the village associations as well as the budget impacts, both side by side and in total. Um, and if we could um, hold the questions till the end of the sales pitch. And I don't have the agenda in front of me. How many minutes do we have? 45. We have 45 minutes. Okay. Thank you. So on the agenda is the roles and responsibility of the village associations as well as the financial summary, which Jackie will handle. And um, the villages provide um, a great deal of um, outreach to the communities. So they um, are independent, incorporated, nonprofit civic associations. And what's interesting is I've, you know, I've met with a lot of the village managers and they will specifically talk about the fact that they really are all different. Um, so it's really interesting. They're independent, which from CA's perspective does make it um, a little more expensive to offer assistance because it's not like there's just one organization that's, I don't know, $6 million. It's 10 individual associations or organizations that we're dealing with. Um, each has a unique set of bylaws and covenants and each has its own community elected board of directors and that process isn't the same. It's interesting to sit in on the meetings so they chat with each other about the process and they're really not all the same. Um, village operations to enforce the covenants, to foster a sense of community and to oversee the village elections. And um, we provide support, uh, with actually they generate income by leasing portions of the building and they offer space um, for free to um, or reduced rates to civic groups and residents. I could, I could, I could spend, so in terms of the operational support that we provide, um, you know, we're, we're around, we uh, certainly provide the buildings, there's 24 buildings that we provide at no cost. Funding for capital improvements, and that's in the proposed FY22 budget that you'll see soon. Um, building maintenance repairs, I think you probably know that our guys are out there a lot. I'm out there a lot and any issues that come up, we respond and if they have a question, you know, we're there for them. Uh, maintenance of the ground, snow removal, trash and debris removal, that's ongoing and, um, you know, we work closely with them in terms of if they have an issue with something. Um, payment of real estate taxes and property insurance, the legal fees for covenant enforcement, um, payment of the employer, employer portion of the village employee benefits and administration and marketing services. And you probably are asking what that actually is. And that's the, um, the audit fees for all employee benefits um, and the complex administration and costs since instead of being a single employer plan, it's multiple individual plans. And then the, um, I'll turn this over to Jackie. Sure, thank you. I think I need the keyboard. I can do it. Or... Good evening, everyone. Um, 
Moving ahead, I am going to kind of go through and translate a lot of what Dennis was talking about into dollars and what that looks like, especially just consolidated and individually for the fiscal year ending FY21. Um, so there's a management contract, of course, in place that pulls everything together as far as building use agreements between CA and each village, outlining the responsibilities with respect to those buildings um, of each party. And the current management contract, we are about halfway through a five-year term of FY19 through FY24. So I would think that probably in the beginning of FY23, there will start to be a work group and conversations about what this next iteration looks like. Um, that would include representatives from the villages as well as, as CA. As far as the annual charge share, the portion of CA's annual charge that is allocated to the villages, um, that is a formula and methodology that was began as part of the FY19 budget process, and um, it's in effect coincidentally or intentionally, I guess, in the same time frame as the management contract, but of FY19 through FY24. So it will, again, that next iteration will come at the same time as the management contract, but they're not one in the same. It's kind of two different, two different um, pieces uh, to these relationships between CA and the villages. So as far as um, talking about the numbers and what that looks like, what I thought that I would start with is, you know, the elephant in the room with everything, which is COVID and the impact that that has had on both the annual charge and the management contract um, unexpectedly and then, you know, continuing for um, quite a while. So, you know, it really changed the trajectory in some ways of, the, of both of those things. Um, FY20, there was, towards the end of FY20 when COVID hit, there was an amendment made to the management contract. Um, so uh, what CA proposed was an increase in the threshold of the repairs and maintenance expenses that the villages pay for as opposed to CA, raising that threshold. Um, and in turn, there would also be a waiving of the repayment of any excess cash reserves from any village back to CA. Uh, that amendment was signed by five of the villages. So herein lies something new that has never happened before, which is that we have five villages that did not sign and are under one type of kind of caveat to the management contract with this amendment and, and five that are not, and that, that continues. Um, moving forward to FY21, we are now, FY21 of course is pandemic from start to finish as far as its impact and the annual charge share was reduced. Um, there was limited capital and operating spending by CA for um, those support of the villages. Six of the villages did receive CARES, either grants and or loans. Um, and then with regard to how we would end up with excess cash reserves for FY21, in an effort to make sure that the villages had enough reserves, um, even more than what would be normal per the management contract, due to such significant losses of revenue from leases and rentals and um, revenue generated from the buildings, uh, the CA board passed a resolution that enabled the villages to retain even more, as I said. Um, and then what was left was several villages, three of them that actually then still did have excess cash reserves. Um, you're gonna see some numbers and what that looks like in a minute, but Part of this resolution was that those cash reserves that are repaid to CA would then be reinvested in those respective villages um, and be used towards environmental related projects. Um, now we go into, you know, we're unbelievably about almost halfway through FY22. And once again, there was a reduced annual charge share and limited capital spending by CA. And then looking ahead and upcoming are budget decisions for FY23 right around the corner. So now we can really get into the fun stuff, which is numbers and data. <laughs> um, 
And here what you can see is that for FY21, there was $43.5 million of annual charge. That's CA, CA's annual charge that was collected. And this is where you can see um, how it, where it went. And I guess the importance in this slide is to just show that you can see the third largest slice of that pie is the villages at 6.1 million. So the 6.1 million, and there are some attachments in the back that break it down, but that's all of the things that Dennis talked about on that one slide with all the, with all the bullets of all the um, support that's provided, the annual charge share, and then the other areas of expenses that um, CA incurs to support the villages or to help with the villages. So um, that 6.1, Right here, what we have is just a 10-year trend. Um, you can see for FY21, it's the 6.1 million. And then just looking back and a little bit ahead, I think that what this really demonstrates is just very consistent levels of support by CA. Um, certainly, if you look at when it jumped up in 2014, I don't feel like this is totally representative. If I had it to do over again, I would not make this scale start at 5 million because you can see that the range really goes from 5.8, we had a blip up here for some additional fees that were incurred to 6.1, very consistent support um, over the years. Now, I will mention in a couple of these places that there are attachments if you want to see a breakdown, and this is one example of that that you may want to look at another time if you really want to dig into the details but for the um, FY19 through FY22 there is an attachment um, it says here attachment B and it includes the breakdown of these amounts by all the different categories so if it's three million of annual charge share how much was for benefits how much was for you know support of other things real estate taxes um, administrative support etc so I'm going to spend a few minutes here on some key metrics. Uh, so in FY21, the cumulative full-time equivalent of all 10 villages was 33.4. So that's full-time equivalents. Um, and of course, what's always going to be interesting is to look back to pre-COVID. In this case, I did FY20 because it was only, you know, uh, COVID impacted the last six weeks of that fiscal year, but you can see it the prior year was 50.5, so quite a significant decrease in um, the village's uh, FTEs. The 24 buildings total approximate square footage is 110,000 square feet. If we go over here to the cash position, you can see the dark blue lines is a three-year trend, what it looked like FY19, FY20, and 21 of total cash, just cash and investment. So what's in the bank in total for all 10 villages? So I can't, 2.9, then at the end of FY20, 3.2, and then getting to 3.3 at the end of FY21. That's, but, that's the villages banks, right? This is all what is sitting with the villages. So remember, um, every quarter, let me back up one quick second. Every quarter, the villages send CA their financial statements after they've been reviewed by the respective village boards. And we look at them and check compliance with the management contract. And then we are the keeper of all this data. Well, this is the one chance where you see then the results of all of that, whether it's side by side. And, and so, yes, this is all village. And, and we did shift, Dick, because we went from $6.1 million of support by CA, but now we're talking about um, uh, village data. So this was cash in their bank. But then, of course, the villages have bills to pay. And some of this cash may be security deposits, right, that they're going to refund back. Or there's deferred revenue where lessee, lessees have paid um, money for future rentals, so there's still a service to provide. So once you carve all of that out and say, okay, the villages have obligations, the villages have certain things that the board has excluded to, of, you know, being um, cash reserves subject to the excess that could be returned, like the resolutions and things that we talked about, um, then what is left? And that's what the orange amounts represent, 
is what we would call cash reserves. So what is left after all of those obligations and all of those additional amounts that have been carved out from an excess calculate cash reserves calculation that could potentially come back to CA. Um, now this excess cash reserves, I found this to be interesting. So FY19, remember everything is normal. The villages, there's, there's no pandemic in sight and they finish the year and they do a calculation to say, okay, we have this much cash. Here's what we have after all of our obligations and exclusions. They apply that to a certain percentage of their operating expenses and anything beyond that is considered excess that would come back to CA. So here's in total what came back to CA in FY19. Had there been no pandemic, this blue line then says what would have been paid if the resolutions and the amendments that we just talked about that, that you guys approved had not happened. Here's what it would have been in FY20 and FY21. Here's what the impact that those resolutions and the amendments had. $1,100 was repaid in FY20 and in FY21, $98,000. This amount, again, is where is going to be reinvested in those um, respective three villages that paid that amount per, per the resolution. Um, I will make note here that there is an attachment mm -hmm. in your presentation, attachment D. It has all of this information broken down by village if you wanted to see that level of detail. Okay, there's a lot of numbers and percentages here, but um, I'll just tell you briefly why I find this interesting and it actually speaks to what the one gentleman said during the resident speak out about how different each village is in their ability to generate revenue um, and their operations. So this is showing of the total revenue for each village, what percentage of it do they generate through newsletter ads, through special events that they charge for, through um, leasing and renting the buildings, as opposed to the annual charge here that CA gives them. So that's why this is called village generated revenue as a percentage of their total revenue. And what is so interesting is here's a pre, totally pre-COVID amount um, percentage, 41% in total, which then ranges from a low of you know, 23%, I think, up to 58% in this blue column um, with an average of 41. I can tell you I look at those percentages every single year, and you could go back years through FY19, and it is very, very constant. You know, it's, it may change a percentage or two among um, various villages, but pretty constant as far as the percentage that they, um, each village generates on their own. But look what happens then when you hit a year with COVID and how much it went, it decreased to a total of 19%. And even that variation, that change, you know, um, everybody was hit hard, but some villages hit harder than others. Um, so, you know, I think the question is, where will the new normal be? That's the question to me. Um, hopefully, we'll go up higher than 19% in total. I'm sure that we will since 20, FY21 was, you know, the big heavy hit um, time, especially for using those buildings. But where will we go? Will we get back to this 41%? You know, we'll see. So, um, a point of interest there. And then the final slide that I wanted to show you and point out kind of goes to the, you know, looking ahead. So one other interesting kind of change or trend or shift that I, I saw was that generally the villages will budget to, they'll end up projecting that they're going to make a little bit of money, maybe lose a little bit of money, some villages, or break even. So what you can see here pre-pandemic um, budgets, in total, and, and again, this is an example of something where there's a breakdown by village in the back. Um, you know, here's the total of what they're saying their increase to net assets are, right? Their net income in total for all 10 villages. So almost a break even. Um, when they revised budgets for FY21 saying, okay, wait a minute, we've got this pandemic 
they um, said, okay, we think we're going to end up at a net loss in total of $73,000. That did not end up happening. They actually ended up in total with net income of over $300,000. And that's all again in the back. But not knowing, not knowing the support that CA may give them, et cetera, they, they projected um, $73,000 negative. The FY22 budgets that have come in, in total are showing net losses of just over $200,000. And there is information broken down by village um, in the attachment. I think I put here it's attachment C, but that, that struck me and I wanted to make sure to include it um, you know, cumulatively and individually for you this evening. So um, that's it. Those are, those are the things that, that we have. Um, and again, there are, oh, let me just mention this also. So attachment A gives you detail on that COVID timeline that I showed you. You know, you, you guys, there was the amendment and then the resolution and the impacts. It just provides you more detail and dollars if you want to dig into that a little bit more. And then again, the um, detail for some of the, the other data. I will tell you, um, going back to this for a minute, there is a slide that gives you this $205,000 by village. And in addition, what it does is, so here it is, here's that $205,000. So you can see there's a few villages that are actually saying, you know, we're gonna work towards breaking even or a very small net loss. Um, and basically, you know, this is occurring because if you look at um, cash uh, expenses and revenues, the decrease in expenses is just not proportionate to the decrease in revenue. It's as simple as that. So, you know, for CA, the way that we have dealt with our significant decrease in revenue is by very difficult decisions scaling back. And you all know a lot about all of that. Um, and so just looking at the numbers, because of course I can't speak to you know, what any of the villagers were, were thinking about as far as these losses, they have, you can see for each one what they're saying. What I did is I compared it to FY19. That's the cleanest way to say what would have looked like compared to pre-pandemic. Um, and they've got certain uh, decreases in revenue, but there isn't an, a proportionate decrease in expenses. And that's what's creating um, these losses. So what we've got and there are any questions yeah Janet Jeannie yeah um, on the cash excess uh, reserves to be invested in the respective villages just two quick questions sure one when do you anticipate uh, if they're entitled to any that they'll get them well Money. that's something that I think Dennis will work on with those villages it's three villages and the those villages and their amounts are all in this packet in case you're curious, but that. Yeah, right. But we don't know whether it's in a month, two months, three months, four months. Is there a reason for that? I haven't um, looked into it as deeply as I could have. What, so, um, so, so the answer is I haven't looked into it as deeply as I could have yet. Okay. Uh, and the other question for that is uh, once they get the money, is there a time frame when it has to be spent? So there's not, but um, we're planning to spend it quickly. Pardon me? We're planning to, um, so you're talking about the money that they have for the work in their villages. The three for the, villages. For the environmental yes. work in their villages, so, um, excess cash. Right, so I talked to John McCoy, we're looking at what projects might be available. We'll take those projects to the village board to review with them, and then once, you know, we're, we're gonna work with the village board in terms of what they'd like to see in their village. Um, and I expect that to happen within the next 60 days. Okay, 60 days is the time frame then yeah. in terms of coming back to you if they have any ideas. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Well, Ash? Uh, great job, Jackie, by the way. Dennis, did so you? The, um, so we were gonna present ideas to them. So do, do you, are you saying that some of the villages might have ideas separate? Okay. Well, some of the residents that are in, have environmental suggestions, yeah. But okay. if, if CAs, I know, will drive this, okay. All right. Ashley? Is there any possibility to receive grants for FY22? 
I mean, th those were CARES grants, so we're all keeping our eyes and ears open. There was something that came up recently that had to do with payroll retentions that we shared information. Um, I think Susan and Lynn did with the village managers, so we're watching. Oh, so it, it came from Columbia Association to the village boards no, the, or the villages watched for it? The, well, I hope that the villages are watching for it, but when COVID first happened and all of this relief, remember the PPP program, and then there were other things, we were watching and sharing information okay. with the villages and saying, hey, you might want to apply for this and that. So, right. yeah, keeping those lines of communication open, but then that is you know, these are federal or state grants or loans that then they were applying for. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Dennis. Okay, next work session topic is the review of summer 2021 outdoor pool season. Good evening. Um, actually, Marty's going to review the, the season um, since he was largely responsible for it. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment and acknowledge Marty and his team and Monica and her team um, for what it took to have this, this outdoor pool season to begin with. Um, even in normal times, getting the outdoor pool spun up every year is a Herculean effort that really takes the entire organization to make it happen. And um, this past year <laughs> had its own set of challenges, as we all know, um, with uh, everything starting with staffing. And uh, then as we were preparing for the, the summer, we had no idea under what mandates we were gonna be operating. Uh, so there was a lot of guessing going on. And as Marty's gonna point out, um, it changed multiple times in a very short amount of time. Um, and just continuing through the uncertainty of the entire summer. Um, and once they were up and operating, I, I can't tell you enough the job that Marty and his team did um, to, to keep these pools running and provide the opportunity for our community this summer. Um, Marty, I think, spent more time in a lifeguard chair this summer than he probably has in the past decade combined. Um, and at the end of the season, Labor Day weekend, uh, you know, that, that whole time period, not only Marty, uh, Adam, his whole team, all the swim coaches volunteered to come in uh, to cover as school started early and we lost a lot of, of lifeguards. So um, Marty's going to uh, paint a pretty good picture of, of what the summer looked like, but Underneath, it's kind of like the, you know, you see the, the ducks swimming across the pond and it looks all nice and calm and the feet are going crazy underneath. Um, it's that sped up a hundred times of, of what this team had to do uh, this summer to, to make this happen. And, and we're very appreciative of truly the sacrifices they made this summer. Um, the, the, their personal well being um, was really challenged and stretched thin. Uh, and so, Again, I can't say enough from beginning to end, Monica's team, Marty's team, uh, to make this happen. Um, but overall, it was a really good summer. Uh, Marty's going to share a lot of the success stories that we had uh, for this summer. And with that, I will turn it over to Marty. Thanks, Dan. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so this summer, we started off uh, on Memorial Day weekend as normal with 15 outdoor pools. Um, we did start with masking and capacity issues, uh, restrictions for the pools and reservations required. Uh, that was just as the vaccines were really getting going and numbers were beginning to plummet. And as you can see, every week, after that, we slowly increased capacity as we got closer and closer to the pool's opening. Uh, when we did open on Memorial Day weekend, we had gotten all the lifeguards, trained everybody, had everybody ready to go. And of course, it was 55 degrees and rainy the first two days the pools were open, and we had almost no attendance till Memorial Day. Um, so we started off started off slow, but the facilities needed the cleaning and the extra work from the, the guards being there after being closed for the past couple of years. 
Um, right around the time school got out, uh, we removed most of the restrictions and the masking requirements, and we were able to get all of our normal Stevens Forest programming going starting June 1st, uh, right after Memorial Day weekend with the yoga and the early morning extended swim hours outdoors. We, as soon as school got out, we started all of our normal summer programming, CNSL, aqua fitness, senior swim, everything got going at all of our different facilities that we normally run throughout the entire summer, as well as extending all the hours. One thing we did this year, because we did not have all the pools open, is all the pool, all the 15 pools that opened ran seven days a week with no closed days. So every one of the pools was open every day, which created some unique challenges for getting the pools vacuumed, getting them mowed, took a lot of extra work from Dennis's open space team and others working a lot of different hours to get all of that maintenance done that we do di differently during a normal summer. Um, around that time, uh, the we got the news that we were gonna try and open some additional pools. And up until around June 16th, we'd actually been running short lifeguards. So when we opened the pools May 29th, we were still short about 40 lifeguards and we were hiring and training all the way up until school got out to help finish staffing up the indoor pools. Around that time, we started hiring to try and open, continued trying to basically hire. We never really stopped hiring training to get uh, Faulkner Ridge and Dasher Green open. And we did not get a single manager or assistant manager application the entire summer. Uh, everybody that we got to run the Faulkner Ridge pool was an internal candidate that reached out to us for a promotion and we were able to do some extra training and get them promoted to help run the Faulkner Ridge pool. So it was internal staff that stepped up who didn't think they were ready before the summer and then decided in the summer to try and help out and help get that um, pool open. So we were able to get uh, Faulkner Ridge open July 19th and then uh, everything ran, all 16 pools ran um, until right around August 30th when uh, we closed the first six pools and that's as school started that week, um, which is the first time school's gone back in six or seven years um, before the Labor Day holiday. And then the last 10 pools closed September 6th this year. We ran all of our normal summer events. So we were stable, still able to, with Ripid events, host the Columbia Sprint Triathlon on June 20th. Uh, we did the bike and pedal to all the pools on July 11th. And we also had the kids triathlon on July 18th. All three are all three events had record attendance. Uh, we had the most attendance we ever had for both the kids try and for the uh, sprint triathlon that we've ever had for either event um, this year, which was fantastic. Um, Ripid events really, really put on a great event for both events uh, with the pools with us. Uh, this year, we were able to get the CNSL going again. Um, it changed all throughout the summer. Uh, it started, it was gonna be all virtual. And then as numbers improved, we flipped to a virtual and live schedule, um, which is what we ended up running with. Um, so it caused a lot of trouble for us, but we were able to make it work, um, trying to make everybody happy. If some people wanted it all back the way it used to be, some wanted it all. This was the best decision to try and make the most number of people using the CNSL this summer happy that we could. Um, you know, attendance was down in the CNSL. So um, as with most CA programming, um, because of the restrictions, some people didn't want to join, but also just people were still nervous a bit about around being around that many people, and that's reflective in that attendance number. Um, for total check-ins for the summer, um, we were at uh, 187,000 for total check-ins. We had 16,000 paid admissions and we had 102,000 mass use. Mass use is all of our activities that don't check in at the pool, 
So CNSL, camps, aqua fitness, uh, we, we have all those programs, the instructors and different things do uh, checks, and we add that uh, after, after the fact. So our total admissions for this summer were about 306,000 for all of the pools. Um, the biggest change you'll notice on there is the mass use, and that is from camps is we had almost no camp activities this summer at the pools uh, for basically really two reasons. First reason was all the pools were being used every single minute they were open. They were either CNSL open to our members, so we didn't have time for large group. And set large groups secondarily, a lot of our large camps that have come to use the CA pools in the past could not come because of the COVID restrictions that they had to work under either busing requirements. You had to, have, you know, they used to be able to come with one bus with 60 kids. Now they'd have to have three buses with kids on one in every seat. So it just was not financially affordable for them to, and to follow those protocols to get kids to and from the different pools. So we did where most of our attendance was lost was through the uh, Memorial Day, the cold Memorial Day weekend, and then through the lack of the extra camp program. Our top four pools uh, this summer uh, were again, River, Dorsey, Kendall, and Swansfield. Um, they were just about normal. If you had had um, a normal Memorial Day weekend attendance at any of those pools, it would almost be exactly the same as 2019 for those facilities. Uh, the reason Kendall Ridge is up so much is in 2019, uh, the, that village, the pools rotate, which one closes early, and Kendall Ridge closed early the summer of 2019. So it was open for a few extra weeks this year, which is why there's such a disparity that the numbers are up there uh, versus 2019. Um, the bottom four are the bottom four that were open. In 2019, the bottom four were Talbot, Bryant Woods, Faulkner, and Jeffers. So they, we compared for this for you guys. So we were able to accommodate almost all the members, you know, as we kind of before the summer, we'd said we get about 85% of the memberships. We were able to do that uh, this summer as well. Um, second Sunday swim, we ran the program again. Um, it, attendance check-in was down for that since 2019, but I will say the, this is not a accurate number for the number of people that come in. Uh, the, it is a manual check-in process that the lifeguards do on a piece of paper because the, they'd have to price override the system. So, and then they have to self-report it and not all of the pools get data. And even if we call, they don't remember or they lose the piece of paper. So it's not an accurate number of the number of users that take advantage of second Sunday swim. Uh, one of the big things, and this is uh, something I talked to Dan about before the summer, as well as I talked about it at every single lifeguard orientation, lifeguard class, was we were going to have more rescues than we've ever seen. And it was exactly as predicted after two years of nobody in the water and kids having grown up and not had that experience. The lifeguards were really busy this summer. We had almost a rescue day and these aren't the normal lifeguard walks over and puts a helping hand or pulls somebody aside. These are the full on lifeguard whistle, jumping in the stand, <laughs> helping rescue the kids in the water. So we had 112 rescues this summer. So the lifeguards were really active and had to be really on top of their game. In addition to the kids, all the cicadas and everything else they were busy watching all summer. One thing we don't talk a lot about too is, you know, when my team is at full force during the middle of the summer, you know, we're between 450 and 600 <laughs> team members. We offer a ton of team events for the lifeguards uh, throughout the summer. We host a daybreak swim every Memorial Day as a training day that the Howard County Autism Society comes out to. Uh, and they do training with the lifeguards <laughs> as well as we get them in the pool and practice. We offer a team volleyball league throughout the summer every Tuesday night, which we get about an average of 150 team members that come out and have supervised volleyball league uh, between the different cluster pools. We host a sports park night for all the lifeguards uh, where we grill hot dogs and stuff for them. And then we have a lifeguard cluster competition at the end of the summer. And this year, the River Hill Hobbits Glen cluster uh, was first place. Uh, Thunder Hill Phelps Lock got second place and the Swansfield Longfellow staff got third place. 
Uh, some things we learned this summer that um, worked well. The, um, the mobile food service, uh, we, we by the end of the summer, it really picked up. We had about six to eight ice cream trucks at the end that had registered with us and were going around to the pools pretty regularly. Uh, one of the things that Tim uh, in the marketing department worked with us is because the schedules were changing so often, this summer, uh, it was about every week we had to update <laughs> schedules instead of printing signs that uh, would have to be taken down and reprinting, you know, the, the signs are a couple hundred dollars each. We were able to do the phone uh, QR code scan that went to a website. So it always was the most up-to-date and accurate schedule, as well as they worked with us uh, using some some idea I had along with the marketing team, we were able to get a pool status live where the lifeguards do count every 15 minutes or so of the number of users at the pool. And then uh, it updates to the CA website. So that way, and then if unexpected closure, something happens, the lifeguards are able to get that status updated a lot faster than a phone call to us, a phone call to the marketing team. So you were able to get a lot faster statuses on the pools uh, when things went wrong or, or were going great. This also helped members figure out where they're going. Our number one challenge, and it's going in, you know, even in this winter and going into next year is going to be we're hiring. Uh, you know, we did not get enough lifeguards this summer. We made it through, but uh, we even this winter, we're probably short during, the, especially during the daytime. We need more lifeguards, and so that is kind of our number one focus right now. Uh, is an aquatics team is we're hiring and trying to get additional staff uh, to get to keep the indoor pools going and to prepare for next summer. So that way we're ready to go to try and open all 23 pools again next year. And with that, any questions? Uh, first, I just wanted to say thank you to Marty and Monica and Dennis for all of your hard work in trying to keep our pools open and staffed and maintained and et cetera. So, mm -hmm. um, yep. so Ashley. And Dick. Sure. Hi, Marty. Uh, so hiring, obviously, difficult for everyone. I was wondering, does Columbia Association have a partnership with the local schools for trying to hire lifeguards? We, we do not. Um, a lot of our kids come from all the local schools, um, but we do we do have a program, you know, if they come and water test and they aren't able to pass, uh, we do work with them and get them uh, with our swim lesson coordinator who helps um, get them through their water test so that they can be a lifeguard with us. Okay. Dick? Um, just wanted to make sure you knew. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, any, is it too early to predict what's going to happen next year, uh, next summer with the pools? Uh, I think that's next meeting, the, it's the beginning of the budget conversation. Uh, well, do you think you're going to have enough lifeguards is what I'm trying to ask. Uh, it's too yeah. early to tell. We, we start hiring the first week of December. Um, so, I mean, as I said earlier, we're planning for 23 pools. So that, that that's where my team's throwing our effort in. Okay, thank you. Sherry? Uh, yeah, again, uh, Marty, I'd also like to really thank you and the entire team for everything that you did. You've got a tremendous staff there. Um, I did notice that of the figures that you threw up, um, that paid admission was up about 4,000. That was the one figure that, that jumped up as, as a as an increase. Can you address that a little bit? When it says paid admission, are those individual admissions? Are they uh, generally families? What what did you find for that? They, 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 it is a total of the number of admissions that were sold. So those are individual admissions. Now it could be a family coming in. I can't break it out into okay. like more transactions, but, but I, I think part of it, especially at the beginning of the summer was, um, you, a lot of people didn't have their membership early on, but we had a great deal with the marketing department where uh, the and uh, the sales team, where if somebody paid at the pool, they could bring their receipt to one of the clubs and apply their uh, admission towards their membership. So a lot of people did take advantage of that. Okay, that's great. And I, I think also with COVID, um, so many people were uncertain, but as the season progressed, um, I think you're right, more and more people became comfortable 
um, with what CA was doing in terms of um, safety and, and all the rest of it. And I think a lot of that was word of mouth. And it was um, a good indication of how many people uh, really wanted to be in the pools. <laughs> so that, that's a real positive. Thank you. Lynn? Um, yeah, I'm looking again at the, um, the numbers of people using the pools, the top four, the bottom four. I mean, the difference is huge. Uh, is that because of the physical size of the pools? Um, you know, it's to go from 24,000 in River Hill to 29,000 and well, to 3,400 in Hobbit's Glen. I mean, that's a huge difference in usage. It, it, it's a little bit location, it's a little bit amenities, it's a little bit of uh, activity, and it's a little bit of each neighborhood. So people travel where they want to go, um, mm -hmm. you know, but we, you know, each pool finds its activities too. You know, one of the things uh, I recently reached out to um, the uh, Harper's Choice Village is I had more positive letters about Hobbit's Glen because it was the first time it had ever stayed open late <laughs> because they've always closed it. And I went to the village because they wanted to get that pool added to the rotation schedule to not always close first. And so, you know, just because the usage isn't there doesn't mean it's not used a lot by the people that do use it. Um, so th th that's the one thing I can say is that the seniors took great advantage of Hobbit's Glen this summer, as well as all the aqua fitness classes we offered there. Were they at capacity or not? Or? No, the only pools that hit capacity when we had the capacity restrictions in place were the top five. So Swansfield, River, Kendall, Dorsey, uh, they, they were the ones we had to turn people away the first few weekends when we uh, hit the capacity numbers. Yes, yeah. Lynn, I think to answer your question, um, yeah, the, the pools are different. And as Marty said, the amenities and the lower used pools um, are just low usage. The people like almost anything we have, the people who use them really love using them. <laughs> um, but there's still a lot of uh, excess capacity available at those pools. Okay, thank you. Okay, Tina. I wanted to ask when you start hiring in December, can you share the link to that with us so we can push it to our schools? Yep, I can do that. Awesome, thank and you. Usually, and usually when we start, I also reach out to all the village managers to post in their newsletters and stuff too. Wonderful, thank you. Eric? Yeah, so one of the things I've noticed, it's hiring has been a challenge, not just for CA, but across lots of different industries. Um, and, I, and I expect that it could be another challenge again for us in December. So. Is there any action that we should be taking as a board to try to facilitate hiring? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know I've reached out to my, my bosses and we, we have some stuff lined up as part of the budget process to help incentivize uh, lifeguards next year to come back and continue to work for us as part of the budget process. So I, I will say uh, right now, I'm at the International Fitness Conference um, and as I'm talking to a lot of owners and executives from across the nation, we're all talking about challenges hiring. Uh, and when you ask what's the most challenging position to hire, anybody that has a pool, the first thing they say is lifeguards. Um, and uh, the myriad of, of things that have been tried to recruit lifeguards is astounding. Um, and uh, even in this area, um, we had almost every other organization who has a pool, including Six Flags, calling us, asking us for staff. Um, because of, of a lot of the organizations in the area, we had been the most successful. Um, but success is relative. Uh, but it is an ongoing conversation. We are exploring every opportunity that we have to, to recruit staff. Um, because as Marty said, our goal is to try to open all 23 pools next year. So that is the, in the forefront of our minds. Thanks, Thanks Dan.
And Dan said it really well. The the it is not just a CA problem with lifeguards. We we are very close with all the other local pool companies in the area, and many of them had to shut down pools early because they didn't have enough lifeguards and closed a lot of pools for their clients and weren't able to fill contracts because they were short lifeguards as well. So it is not just a CA issue. It is a Maryland and probably a national issue too for the lifeguards. Uh, Marty, can you just speak a little bit to the rescues? Uh, why did you assume it would go up this year and do you know why it did? Yeah, so with nobody having been in a pool, so if you think summer 2019, if you had a one-year-old that was using a wading pool, by the, with, if they had not used a pool or been to a facility in three years, the difference between a one-year-old and a three-year-old is a huge amount on what they're willing to challenge themselves with. And if they've not been doing swim lessons where they would play in the wading pool, they're a lot braver. And if you've not had that two-year transition, the kids will just naturally push their boundaries a little further than they should. And, and that's what leads to those rescues is not being familiar with the water. And and so that that's why I assumed a lot of rescues were gonna happen. Right, thank you. Just to, to support that and, and the work that Marty and the team are doing, um, and, and Marty can speak a little more detailed about this, but um, last week we opened uh, registration for our swim lessons and it filled up to about 99% of capacity in a matter of minutes. Wow. Um, so uh, so hopefully, you know, we're, we're gonna be on a good trajectory to, to mitigate that as we go into next year. Oh. Thank you. Uh, any final questions? All right, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Marty. Thank, thank you. you. All right, next section are the question only. So um, this includes the development track, tracker, capital projects, open space, pre-filled <laughs> state legislation, board priority review, which I will speak to, um, chair's remarks. Any, any questions to start? Yeah. Uh, Ginny and then Sherry. Okay, uh, the Columbia Sheridan, or I think there's gonna be a new name for it. But Merriweather. Put Merriweather. Lake, Merriweather Lakeside. Lakefront? Or Lakeside Lake or Lakefront. Lakeside, whatever. Lakehouse. Lakehouse. Close uh -huh. enough, close okay. enough. <laughs> okay, can we move on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I just, uh, is uh, Jessica on the phone? Or, or? Jessica's not here today. Okay. I would just like to uh, really uh, make sure the board uh, really is involved in the easement request and really understands it in a timely fashion. Uh, I'm just concerned about that. Uh, we can add that to the topics log if you want. Yeah, thank okay. you. So Jessica had a conflict with a planning board. Who Correct, was she's testifying too. Oh. <laughs> Uh, Sherry? Um, yeah, a question came up um, in, in, in the village about um, the mill producers development. Um, there's a lot of um, activity suddenly going on, a lot of earth moving, a lot of stuff. Um, there was concern about the impact on, um, on the local schools. And I didn't remember, I'm sure that this came up during when we first reviewed this with the planning board and all of that, but I don't remember if there was, number one, an impact study um, about the local schools and how that um, uh, meshes with the building of the next high school and school uh, redistricting. <laughs> and, um, and then the other thing was about there were some concerns about um, environmental issues, particularly around flooding um, and uh, stormwater mitigation and management during the development of that project. So I've sort of been asked to report back, um, and I'm sure Jessica has the information. Okay, yeah, can you, I mean, we can do two things. I, I think the best place to start is with Jessica. So if you could send a, I mean, I can just email her. Directly, yeah, yeah, directly, and but copy I, the board so that we all get. Yeah. Things so up. I didn't know whether anybody else had heard anything or mm -hmm. had any concerns about that. So I'll, I'll contact her I've directly. Not heard okay. Anything. Thank you, uh, Andy. Um, Sherry, you might want to just check, um, like with Christiana, to 
um, that property should have been subject to the adequate mm -hmm. facilities ordinance, um, <coughs> you know, which addresses schools and roads and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, so, sure. <laughs> yeah. It might have been, it's been so but long. Two, but two years goes, anyway. It's only five years. Okay. <laughs> you, know, you know, once. once well, it looks like down. things are moving this very, very fast. For two years. And that's why people oh, were asking okay. because I think there are 300 plus units that are supposed to go mm -hmm. up. There's going to yeah. be a huge volume of traffic mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, so the impact. Um, as far as how that meshes with these other programs has been a concern. I'd, I'd like to be able to at least get some report back. Jessica may, mm -hmm. may know that, so I will ask her about it. Sounds good. Yeah, uh, yeah Eric. I, do, I do have one comment on that is that w with regard to adequate facilities, I know sometimes they calculate um, new construction very differently from um, resale construction, and the problem there is new construction eventually turns into resale. So I think that's another thing we need to be aware of when it comes to uh, um, adequate facilities. Yeah, and, and the other, um, if I may just say, I don't know whether anybody else is experiencing any issues with infill projects where there is flooding or stormwater issues. Yes. Um, but if you're, uh, if you have anything like that, if you can just drop me an email. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. So, actually, I did what uh, Janet suggested. I sent it to Jessica on Jordan Overlook. Oh, okay. But I guess you also suggested I CC the whole board, and I didn't do that. Okay. I think it's helpful because I think everyone's interested. No, I think in you're right because it's exactly what you're talking about. Uh, I wanted to give the board, it's been a while since we've actually had a priority um, check in, so I just wanted to sort of go through our list of the priorities that we identified last June. Um, the first one we had was the president CEO evaluation. So as you know, we completed our piece of that. Um, I have shared and reviewed that with Lakey. So I just want to remind everybody that starting the beginning of November, the board will have two weeks to do the interim review. Um, so this has two parts to it. One is to provide Lakey mid-year feedback so that if there's anything that we'd like to comment on um, or provide feedback on, she has that to work with for the rest of the year. Um, and then two, also just to make sure that the process we put in place is working. <laughs> and so if we need to make any tweaks before it counts in uh, the spring, then we can do that. So um, that's the status of that. So with Symphony Woods, the subcommittee presented its report in September. Um, next steps are for staff to use that input and come back to the board with a recommendation. Uh, we were hoping for the end of October, but with all of the budget process going on and the scenarios for that, um, you know, as well, as well as some other demands on staff time, that expectation has gotten pushed. So I'm waiting to hear back on a, an exact date for that, but um, it will not be end of October. Um, we're hoping for some time in November, uh, but I will let you know. On that, uh, I think Lakey requested us to uh, provide her with a list of things that were our priority, the board's priorities for the staff to conduct negotiation. So I think we're gonna to have to make some modifications to the presentation that we uh, originally presented in order to get down to just what the specific items are that uh, we should prioritize. We had a I didn't lot of take that note from that meeting. The only follow-up item I had was the revision which Andy put out, so I'm not sure. And actually, well, well, the, if we the, can share that document with Ashley and Eric so that they have it. Um, mm -hmm. Is it ready to go? I mean, can I, can I share it? Uh, yeah, I mean, oh, as far as okay. I, I was... Good. You mean as amended by the, by the as board, amended, the yeah. subcommittee so, as amended? Yeah. I'll be happy that to was, share. But that was the only action item available. I had logged but, from but the that other, meeting. The other thing was the timeline, and that's where Lakey was concerned. We, yeah, we the timeline's sort of out the window. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> let's just, actually, maybe let's just take the timeline out but because I think... off the table. Yeah. 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 Um, but I think we can just, give you a, a... We have yeah. it. It's done. Thank you. I mean, it was, yeah, I mean, the chair is just I thought spoken. so. It's just a matter of releasing it to the board. It's done. Okay, next um, next yeah. piece was the HOCO general plan. So last meeting, Jessica compared our, you know, the position that we had put out with the information coming out of the county. Um, we had, you know, a couple of things. One, um, we want to make sure in the next BOC that we're allowing adequate time for discussion going forward. Um, and then I've asked Jessica for um, sort of, checkpoints for us where we want to pay attention and make sure that 
you know, specifically like ahead of any key things or following the release of a report or those sorts of things, that those are the times that we make sure that we have time built into the schedule. So um, I'm keeping an eye on that, but if anyone knows things that are coming out, please let me know and we'll just make sure. Um, and next BOC meeting will be November, so um, we'll wanna make sure that we have an idea of what's going on for that. Um, and then the last one that we identified as a priority was the community engagement. We, you know, we discussed this and then, um, you know, we realized that Columbia Association under Tim and Danica's leadership has really run with the whole communication and the outreach. Um, so I think, you know, where that leaves us is sort of absorbing that information and continuing to, um, you know, gratefully receive those reports. Um, and then, you know, some of the other things that are going on are like the education processes where, um, you know, the first one is going to be on stream restoration. So more general, like what's CA doing? How do they do it? Um, and, and, you know, establishing an additional outreach that way. So, um, you know, so I think our role in that and, you know, feel free to weigh in, but our role in that is to participate and then encourage our villages to participate in those processes and make sure that um, you know, anyone who reaches out to us has the information and is aware of what's going on that, you know, we can continue to push that that way. Um, and then finally, one of the things we had talked about was the diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, not as a specific priority in and of itself, but as something that spanned all of our priorities and that should enter into everything we do. And in that vein, we have scheduled the um, DEI training for November 19th and 20th, so please mark your calendars. Um, I did send out a shared calendar placeholder, mm -hmm. um, so you should have it in your calendar, and as soon as I get more details, um, I will send those out. Okay. Um, all right, so... I'm switching up the chair's remarks a little bit. One, because I'm never organized enough to send them to Janet the Friday before the meeting. <laughs> um, and two, I think it's, uh, it's a little bit more timely if I address things as they come up in the meeting or as they're about to come up in the next meeting. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, first, I just wanna remind everybody that this weekend, Friday and Saturday is Longreach's 50th birthday. So um, parking may be limited because most of the stuff is happening in that main front lot. So um, just keep that in mind. But um, if you want the schedule or anything like that, it's at longreach50.com um, and you can check that out. But it you know, looks like it will be a lot of fun. Um, That's Saturday and Sunday. No, Friday and Saturday. Friday night and, and all day Saturday. Is it on the Longreach Village Board? Uh, you know, it's 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 hidden on there, so I suggest longreach50.com is your better bet. Okay. Um, you, you could find it, but it, it's tougher to find Thank it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Eric and Ashley, I just wanted to welcome you. It's, you know, we're, we're actually we're doing pretty well on time tonight, so that's good, but welcome. I um, hope you had a good first experience on the board, and we're happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, well, I, you know, I also just wanted to thank everybody for their contributions to the meeting, for all of the senior staff that, you know, I know a lot of work goes into preparing for these meetings and then the time you spend here, so thank you, I appreciate that. Um, our next meeting, keep in mind that we will be looking at the budget scenario, so that obviously has demanded a lot of staff time, I'm sure. Um, and you know, this is a new way for us to conduct our budget process. So I'm you know, asking you to please review the materials for that meeting very thoroughly so that we can have a really robust discussion around those scenarios. <clears throat> and if you have questions, um, try to ask them ahead of time so that we can focus on everyone understanding the material rather than trying to um, you know, figure out what's going on. <laughs> so if you get the materials and something is unclear, please ask ahead of time so that we can just make sure that we get as much out of those sessions as possible. Um, and then, uh, let's see, what else do I have? Uh, yeah, so the, I mean, those materials will be posted October 22nd. Um, keep in mind, our next meeting, because it's a budget discussion, may have a number of residents. Um, so you might just want to 
uh, mentally steel yourself for some additional um, commentary on, you know, we've gotten a lot of written commentary from villages, um, thankfully, but I think, you know, people um, often come and they want to share their, their budget um, testimony, so um, that, that might be happening, and yeah, Tina. There's a meeting for next Thursday on the calendar on the website. That one we, oh, uh, we'll, we'll take that one off. We, okay. we eliminated that one last time. That's what I thought. Got it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so we originally had that one slotted in case right. we needed an extra budget meeting, and I think we decided, we at least most people decided. <laughs> we don't have a meeting next We week. do not have okay. a meeting next Thursday. The next meeting is October 28th. Got it. Um, all right, so I think, I think that's it. So I'll stop talking now. Um, all right, so next on the agenda is proposed new topics. Sherry. Yeah, um, also I'd really like to thank uh, the new, our new board members and it, um, it occurred to me since we have had uh, new board members that this would be a really good time for everybody to get a copy of the board policy book, to, to have a board policy book distributed to every member of the board. Wow. Um, CA has a five-year strategic plan um, having that policy book available, which has a lot of history in it and touches on a lot of the topics that we're talking about now and will be talking about for the rest of the year, um, particularly where policies and procedures are concerned. And so sometimes it may seem very arcane why the board is doing something, but in most cases we're following a procedure that was set up um, in, in, in past years. Um, this is sort of a continuation of a board initiative that, believe it or not, started about two years ago. And, um, and I will fully admit that um, Duke and I were, <laughs> were engaged in this. We, 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 yeah, yeah, we bit off way more than we could chew. So I, I, think, um, I think the best thing that we can do right now is just to make sure that all board members have the same information. So that it's not that older board members, those of us who, who've you know served before, know stuff that that other people don't know. It should be something that everybody everybody has the same information, um, and it's a powerful resource for topics and issues that we're going to be facing. Thank you. Um, so, um, so let's my, add. my only other question to the to the full board is um, about uh, a board a board member orientation night. Um, we used to do this in the past, um, and um, so just as a way of reviewing the same kinds of things we're talking about, how do board meetings uh, usually go, what kinds of procedures, what kinds of, of meeting rules are we using, um, it, you know, it can be just a conversation, it can be question and answer, but I think having that policy book and then having a little bit of time set aside, I'm happy to be part of that process. Um, I'm a board of former board chair, so I've seen a lot. <laughs> Been there, done that. And um, so if there are some other people who would like to be part of that, I'm really happy to, to sit down with you guys and just answer some questions. So maybe if we could get a room here. Um, and we could just uh, just do that. Susan. So um, I was tasked with uh, emailing Ashley and Eric tomorrow morning to say, you know, welcome, we're gonna do, we want to have a new board orientation like we did with Tina and uh, open that up for the board. So we're gonna ask you guys for to look at a couple dates and, and then we'll get that out to the full board. Great. Okay. Thanks. All right, that's great. That's great. Wasn't well, that time? We're gonna, <laughs> we were gonna work that. Perfect segue. Uh, right. Dick and then Andy. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm gr uh, glad Sherry brought that up. Uh, I will tell you, uh, when I joined the board, it was about two years before I figured out what was going on. So <laughs> it's very helpful to, uh, I mean, it, it, a lot of it's pretty arcane. Um, but uh, you mentioned a policy book, and last I heard, Lakey was going to put something together for us. Uh, are, are you aware of something I'm not aware of? No, and, but, but I think this is a really good time to to, no. to do that. So can we at least put that on? The, yeah, we'll add it to the tracking. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let's put it on there. Um, when when Luke and I were working on this, unfortunately, um, my copy is kind of scribbled. 
so I don't have a clean copy. Oh, but you have a copy that would indicate what had been in a report. Uh, uh, we have a lot of pages. Oh, so you mean when you got all the policies. Okay, I mean, I know Lakey yeah. did have somebody going yeah. through them, so I'm yeah. sure that that is yeah, in I progress. Down what room what happened is, yes, we were given a stack of stuff. Yeah. And it was all two-sided. Yeah, we're not going to go through all this. No, again, no, yeah. I'm just saying that that yeah. we did a lot of the stuff, and it just it was obvious that this was going to take right. more time. Right. I thought there, you, like you had an old policy book. Um, Susan, did you have something? No, I, I know that that um, has been something that's been worked on, kind of in fits and starts with um, uh, the priority, just the priorities and resources that have been available mm -hmm. to that. And, uh, and the and the um, asking the vacancy in the general counsel's position absolutely delayed that a little bit. So yeah. And, yeah. and one other thing, one of the things that we discovered is there's a lot of contradiction in them. Exactly, and I think that's and, the and biggest and issue. So there may we may have to have some votes on which mm -hmm. which policy supersedes the other yeah. policy. Right. Yes, and I'm guilty of that myself because I created the time limit policy and there was already one that was even stricter than the one I presented, so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Andy. So do you want to reconsider? Just, <laughs> we can just revoke it and go back to the oh, old God. one. Andy. I just wanted to uh, um, okay. you know, make sure the new board members were um, aware and remind the old board members former, that um, we do have the shared drive on Google Drive so to get called to board information that has a ton of information that everybody has access to. Um, and I would encourage you to look at that because it's got um, the members, the budget prepped. I mean, it's just got committees, all types of things. So when you get access. Um, Which will be midnight tonight. That's right. <laughs> um, that's probably one of the folders you really want to kind of go look at. Um, in the Google Drive and the shared drives. Are they going to have to have their pictures taken too for the? Uh... Well, they're on they're on the hook for their own pictures, so I think oh, they, they I, can go. I ahead. submitted one. Okay. We're waiting to see if it'll be okay. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have one set up. Yep. <laughs> Janet took care of that. Yeah. But other Janet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know it gets really it right, yeah. gets really fun. Really. <laughs> Janet takes right, care of them. Ginny. Right? <laughs> yeah. Looking forward to um, seeing the. the yeah, pictures. actually, you don't Andy. Know who you are? Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Andy, what you were saying, um, I, I support. I was going to say uh, I love what Sherry's saying, but I'd love to see it on the Google Drive so that it's there once and for all um, but because people tend to lose books, et cetera. I know I gave all my stuff. I cleaned out a lot and gave it to Sherry one day. <laughs> it was great. Sherry's great. archives. Yeah. Wow. Um, so uh, the, the second thing is I'd like to see us change uh, pre-filed state legislation to pre-filed state and county legislation. I agree. Um, uh, in the f from now on. Uh, maybe that comes under uh, proposed new topics. And uh, I'd like to see Council Bill CB82, the minimum wage bill, be added to proposed there's topics. A, there's a Google survey out for that, so everyone who would like to weigh in on the three Was questions. That that? Was that on that? And I will send it to you both tomorrow. Okay. Oh. Uh, there are three questions, minimum wage, the well, the one was tree. one was tree canopy, but the other one was much more extensive in terms of pathways. Okay. Right. Yes. Yeah, I, I answered. You said it. You said it already, and I answered that. Yeah, you had. Okay. You had, you so, had, is, once everyone answers, we'll have our answer on whether or not that the board is. I determined. didn't realize this was okay. And the other is just we talked about the Sheridan being a proposed new topic or under development tracker. That's it. Yep, got that. All right. Anything else? Mm -mm. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for the robust conversation. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Jenny moved. Dick seconded. Any objection? Okay. Meeting adjourned at 918. Thank you, everyone. All right.